Okay, uh, part two, chapter nine. We're gonna continue um, talk about asteroids and comets and go to dwarf planet this time. So our goals of learning, how big uh, can a comet be? And what are Pluto and other large objects of the Kuiper belt like? So uh, when you're looking at the Pluto's orbit, we just, I talked about it in part one very briefly, but when you're looking at it, that's the, uh, the darker blue is the orbit of Neptune and the light blue is the orbit of Pluto. It is inclined about 17 degrees with respect to the plane of solar system. Now, Pluto's orbit is tilted and it is significantly elliptical. It, remember the eccentricity? The eccentricity is how uh, you know, off it is from a perfect circle. In terms, uh, in this term, Pluto is very eccentricitic. It is also very elliptical. Now, Neptune orbits three times during the time that Pluto orbits twice. Uh, also, um, that the reason that we did you not you know, collide is because we have a, a resonance. Uh, that's preventing the collision. So uh, what's the Pluto like? So its, it's largest moon, Charon, is nearly as large as Pluto itself, probably made by major impact. So um, we believe just like that, what we have on Earth, that we have Earth and moon, uh, being, moon being created by a major impact as we just um, you know talked about it and I, you saw a video in class when we were meeting in person before. Uh, we believe that Sharon happened to be formed in the same way, in the same manner. And uh, the other very important thing is that Sharon and Pluto, I'll talk about it later on in a little bit, uh, happen to move around one another. It's not like moon that rotates around Earth they both rotate around one another. Pluto is very cold. Uh, it's about 40 Kelvin. Um, remember, the water freeze at 273 Kelvin. Okay, water froze uh, in a 273 Kelvin. Now, Pluto is obviously very cold. It's really far in the edge of the solar system. 40 Kelvin is the estimated temperature. And it has a very thin uh, nitrogen atmosphere that freezes um, onto the surface of Pluto when it goes further away from the sun. So in other words, somehow like this, if I have, if, if I consider this being the orbit of Pluto, okay, with sun at the center, okay, and Pluto, uh, not sun in the center, actually sun should be right here in one of the focus points, okay? So right here, all right? When a Pluto is close, its surface or its atmosphere is a form of gas, but when it's really further down, its atmosphere froze into the surface and it is mostly nitrogen and methane, okay? So, that's how cold it can get. And the New Horizon uh, has revealed a geological activity on the surface. Um, we, we had no idea that um, you know, a, um, a planet far away can be active until we send New Horizon uh, you know, mission to um, specifically observe um, and look for behaviors of Pluto. But is Pluto a planet? It's much smaller than eight major planets. It's even smaller than our moon. Uh, and it's not a gas giant like the outer planets. So remember we had four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Uh, and then we have four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, um, Uranus, and Neptune, right? These eight planets uh, and then uh, the the and the giants are mostly you know gaseous, but uh, the Pluto is not like that. Pluto is more um, you know look like a terrestrial planet. It is mostly a form of ice, it has icy composition, just like a comet. Uh, it is very elliptical and inclined orbit. So Pluto has more in common with comets than with the eight major planets. Okay. 
in fact, as I said in the, in the first part, uh, Pluto is one of the Kuiper Belt objects, one of the uh, objects, bigger objects of the Kuiper Belt. Now, if you want to, um, you know, compare the size of Charon and uh, Pluto, um, compared to United States, that's Pluto, and that's Charon, uh, one of the uh, many moons that's orbiting around uh, Pluto. And it was discovered in Flagstaff, Arizona in 1930s uh, by Clay de Tamba. So um, it's very recent. It's less than 100 years. Now, this is an image, the best image that uh, Pluto, uh, that shows Pluto from a Hubble Space Telescope. We had, this is the best resolution that we could, we could do with a Hubble Space Telescope. What this thing is telling me is that even though, uh, you know, um, Hubble Space Telescope is very powerful, Pluto is really far away, that all we could get is an image like that. But then, uh, Pluto's moon was discovered in 1978, so very recently. It is, uh, you know, orbitally locked to Pluto. They are moving around, uh, around the center of mass. It's not like uh, Sharon is moving around Pluto. They both rotate around one another. So that's Pluto, and that's Sharon. And uh, if you want to take a look at this, uh, the Pluto and Charon, but then we have Hydra and Nix, uh, the two other moons of uh, Pluto later on found. So Charon, big, um, you know, compared to Pluto. Um, and if you want to compare the size of Earth, that's probably the, the best uh, accurate, you know, um, comparison. Um, or, you know, what we call it is a double planet system because they both rotate around one another. And it orbits every 6.4 days and same, uh, you know, rotation as the Pluto's. But then uh, two new moons found, uh, uh, you know, in 2012. So um, we had two moons discovered um, in 2005 and then two new moons in 2012. So uh, this, this is Pluto, this is Sharon. Uh, this is Hydra and Nix, but then we have uh, Curb and STYX later on found in 2012. Pluto, uh, in fact, as I said, it's really cold. It's about 40 Kelvin uh, degrees, uh, but then we have uh, water is really frozen. It looks like, you know, rock on Earth, but then we have these flowing of glaciers uh, that are made of nitrogen and methane and carbon monoxide. So this area is showing you a glacier form of methane, uh, nitrogen and carbon monoxide. So, um, you know, as you can see, the different colors show, indicate a different composition. Mountain view made of, uh, you know, uh, water ice. This is just a, a simulated flyover of a Pluto surface. I uh, got this image from uh, YouTube. Um, it, it is just a, you know, a flyover from a, a Pluto surface. It's very cool. It's about two minutes. So um, go to the PowerPoint, grab this link, uh, you know, paste it to the browser, and then you see a flyover of a Pluto. It's very cool. Just take a look at it. But now the question is, if you're talking about uh, Pluto is being more similar in composition to the comets, uh, the question is, how big can a comet be? So do we, do we have to call Pluto a big comet, or do we have to call Pluto a dwarf planet? Let's find out. So uh, only recently, I mean, in the past 30 years, in the 1990s, the Kuiper belt has been directly detected. Okay, this image is from, um, you know, Keck Observatory. Now we have more than a thousand uh, known objects of a Kuiper belt. So, as I said, this is from a 10 meter Keck uh, telescope. It was one of the most powerful uh, telescope in the world. But as you're looking at this image, you can see all of these little dots, all of these little, uh, you know, shapes. If you're following my cursor, you know what I'm talking about. And then the thousands and thousands of them in here. 
not just big ones. These are the big, you know, um, objects, but also not only those, there are millions of these objects in the Kuiper belt. Discovering of a large ice belt. So later on in summer of 2005, astronomers discovered Iris. It is an ice belt even larger than Pluto, but being far further away. And uh, Iris has even a moon. So this would be uh, even larger than Pluto, but it also has a moon. And it's further down, way further than Pluto. So, uh, and then later on they discovered that this is, these are not the only objects that has the gravity to form them a, a spherical shape but there are many icy objects like Pluto in and, and a highly elliptical and inclined orbit past the orbit of Neptune. Uh, as I said, the um, largest one is Iris, which is compared to, compared to the size of Earth. It's even larger uh, than our moon. So if you want to compare them. And that's what I was talking about. So that's the orbit of, that's the orbit of Neptune right there in a blue orbit but then you have pluto and a lot of these objects but the second object and second massive kuiper belt object was iris okay and look at its highly elliptical orbit now some of um so as i said are they like large comets or are they just a small planets or dwarf planets Other, other Kuiper belt objects. Most have been discovered very recently, so little known about them. As I said, Iris was discovered in 2005. So we are still in the um, you know, way to understand you know, its composition. Besides, it's really far away that with the telescopes on Earth or even with the telescopes around, like in the atmosphere, uh, above the atmosphere in the space, we, we have, you know, we don't really get a lot of information. So we have to send missions and spacecraft to, the, to these, um, you know, to these um, objects. So NASA New Horizon mission will, uh, you know, fly by, do a flyby to some of these Kuiper Belt objects. And uh, it's actually doing it right now as we're speaking. So what have you learned? How big can a comet be? The Kuiper Belt uh, from which comets come from contains objects as large as Pluto and Iris. Pluto and other dwarf planets are more like large comets than like major planets. So that's why uh, they are not part of a, uh, one of the planets anymore, especially because they, we put them on the category of a dwarf planet, but they are not like planets. They're just more like comets. And large objects in the Kuiper belt have tilted highly elliptical orbit, icy composition like those of comets. All right, um, I think this would be the last part of this chapter, chapter nine. Uh, we're gonna talk about the impact, the collision that these objects might have in future to our planet. So did an impact kill dinosaurs? How great is the impact risk and how do Juvion planets affect impacts rays and life on Earth? So did an impact kill dinosaurs? Yes. The short answer to that is yes. Are you sure? Yes, 100%. Uh, so small objects impact all of the planets every day. As we are speaking right now, as you're watching this video right now, there is an object coming to the uh, atmosphere. Okay, it happens every day. Larger impacts, however, are also still occurring uh, you know, such as the uh, Levi Shoemaker 9 impacted Jupiter in 1994. If you don't, if you know, don't know about this, search it on YouTube, you'll see a simulated image of this impact. It's very cool. But that happens very recently. It happened on Jupiter in 94, so it might happen in future on Earth. And uh, for example, uh, Shiva, uh, Shoemaker Levi, nine causes string of violent impacts on Jupiter in 94. So, uh, so these strings of craters happened because of the, you know, tidal forces. Remember that we were talking about a tidal force uh, last 
chapter, we were talking about the ring of Saturn and how it ended up being created. The ring of Saturn is because if there is a moon or if there is an object big enough that's coming towards Saturn because of a tidal force that is much greater on the front compared to the end, this little object will be torn apart, will be break to the pieces. And those pieces will eventually form a ring. This is the exact same thing that happens to Shoemaker Levi 9, causing these, you know, uh, chain of debris or chain of comet impacts happen on the surface of Jupiter. In fact, Jupiter is also responsible for affecting the path of a lot of comets. So let's say that this is the path of the comets that's following this dash line right there, okay? But in its way, it is encountering the Jupiter's gravity. So the gravity of Jupiter will be, you know, affecting the orbit, causing this to go into another orbit much closer to the sun. And this means that this will trap, um, you know, between the, uh, the sun and Jupiter. And that's why a lot of short period comets or Jupiter family comets are having a period of, uh, you know, less than 10 years. For example, Comet Anki has a period of 3.3 years. It's because, uh, as their name suggests, Jupiter family comets uh, are more affected by Jupiter. They're coming in, the gravity of Jupiter affecting them, they get trapped between Jupiter and Sun. Now look at this uh, crater chain, okay? This crater chain is in Callisto, which is a moon, um, but it looks like the tidal force break it to the pieces and then the chain of, uh, you know, uh, impact happen on the surface. The impact of uh, Shoemaker Levi 9 was big enough that it rise up to the surface, up to the, uh, you know, atmosphere above the surface of the Jupiter. That's the uh, dusty debris of the impact site right there. This is the artistic conception or concept or artistic image of the impact. And, but then we can see the different, you know, several impact sites right there, right there on the surface of Jupiter. That's an infrared image um, of uh, impact of Shoemaker Levi on uh, Jupiter. But, the question is, did an impact kill the dinosaurs? As I said, yes. And, uh, you know, fossil records shows occasional large dip, dips in the discovery of a species. That means mass extinctions. The most recent one was 65 million years ago, that ending the, uh, the era of dinosaurs. Now, how do we know that? It's because of iridium evidence of an impact. Iridium is a very, very, very rare on Earth rocks and surface, but it's often found in meteorites. So um, we have found a worldwide uh, layer containing iridium laid down to 65 million years ago. So we believe, in other words, we believe that an impact of a big meteorite, about 10 kilometers in, you know, in size, happened on Earth 65 million years ago, leaving all of these iridium to the surface, but they, they eventually, due to gravity, happen to collide and come down to the Earth's surface. So now we have a very thin layer everywhere on Earth, thin layer of iridium covering all Earth's surface, which is old as 65 million years ago. So dinosaur fossils are all lay, uh, lie below this layer. Let's take a look. So if you're looking, this is the, this thin layer is the, uh, is the iridium layer that I'm talking about. And this is old as 65 million years. Any layer above it, that's just like normal rock. But all the dinosaur layers is below it, which means the dinosaurs died 65 million years ago. And then this layer happened to cover, uh, you know, cover them no dinosaur fossils found above this layer. So what would be the consequences of an impact? A meteorite 10 kilometer in size would send a large amount of debris into the atmosphere, okay? And these debris will cover 
uh, the atmosphere, reducing the amount of sunlight reaching to the surface of the Earth. Now, this means the huge impact on the climate. Huge climate change will eventually cause a very cold temperature on Earth and cause mass extinction. So that's a likely uh, impact site in Mexico. A geologist found a large subsurface crater, 65 million years old in Mexico, the exact same uh, you know, um, age of the iridium that we found uh, you know, in rocks. And um, the size of crater suggests that it was a 10 kilometer in diameter object. And uh, you know, it was big enough to send these debris up to the atmosphere, removing some of the atmosphere sending these debris to the atmosphere, covering everything around Earth, blocking the sunlight, and causing a huge uh, you know, um, climate change. But do we, are we on risk? How great is the risk of impact? Now, asteroids and comets have hit Earth before. We know it. We have no, no doubt about it. A major impact is only a matter of time, not if, but when. Okay, we're not talking about, uh, you know, if that happens, it will happen. We have no doubt about it. But the question is, when will that happen? Okay. The other very important thing to have in mind is that major impacts are very rare. Okay. The extension level events are about, you know, millions of years, a hundred million of millions of years to, to happen. But it, it will happen. I mean, it has happened before when it killed dinosaurs. Uh, but uh, the major damage uh, will have a tens of thousands of years. So if I have a you know, big asteroid colliding with the Earth to cause the extinction, it happens every millions of years, uh, hundreds of millions of years. But then the, the one that causes major damage will probably be every uh, tens of uh, thousands of years. So let's take a look. This is in Russia in February 2013 releasing energy equivalent to 500 kiloton nuclear bomb. It can do it if it's big enough. Just give you an idea how this can look, okay? If you haven't seen this video, I encourage you to search it on Google and just say the, uh, you know, asteroids um, in uh, impacting Russia, something like that, you'll see the video. Uh, to some degrees, it is very, you know, horrifying and you know, scary, but, and in other words, it's happening again everywhere in the solar system. So it's not, you know, avoidable. In uh, Sibria in um, June 30, 1908, and a 40 meter object, you know, happened to explode and the atmosphere shattered to pieces and hit the ground causing a catastrophic event and causing a lot of damage. And a meteor, uh, you know, crater in Arizona. It's about fifty thousand years old, and it's. Uh, we believe that it was a fifty-meter object that causing this. And uh, as we said, the um, the size of the crater is about ten times the size of, uh, you know, the actual, uh, you know, meteor. So just to give you on a scale, this is the two hundred meters. And we believe the actual object was about 50 meter. Frequency of impact. Now let's talk about it. So one meter object will probably happen every day or every, you know, a month or something happen on Earth somewhere. If you go to a one kilometer object to hit the Earth, this will probably happen every one million years. 10 kilometer object, 10 kilometer object is probably every 100 million years. The last time was 65 million years ago. So it might happen, I don't know, next week, it might happen 40 million years from now. So small impacts happen almost daily, but impact large enough to cause mass extinction are many million years apart. Are we doing anything about these? Yes, uh, we are doing a lot of things about us. Go to this website that I have on the screen, NASA.gov uh, Asteroid Initiative. 
and uh, you know there are a lot of information there it is out of the scope of you know this chapter so I'm not going to talk more about this but if you're interested to more to know more just go ahead and type that on Google and it will get you to that you know website you can learn more about it how do Juvian planets affect impact rates and life on Earth so that's a uh, image of the solar system. We have sun, we have the terrestrial planets, and uh, we have the asteroid belt here, and then we have Juvian planets, right? And then Kuiper belt and Oort cloud. Now, all of these belts, Kuiper belt, Oort cloud, asteroid belt, they can send objects towards the sun and towards the earth, okay? Now, the gravity of Juvian planets, especially Jupiter, because it's the most massive one, it's the biggest one, and much closer to the Earth. So this is 5 AU from the Sun. But uh, Saturn is 9 AU away, so this is much closer to Earth. It's rotating much faster. Now, especially Jupiter can redirect comets. Jupiter has directed some comets towards Earth. Oh no, towards Earth, are they gonna you know, have an impact with us? But the good news is that it has ejected many, many more back to the Oort clouds. In other words, it is somehow shielding Earth. It is somehow protecting Earth. So these objects are coming towards Earth, but this guy is protecting us. It will either trap them and they will eventually be uh, you know, one of its moons or one of the objects rotating around Jupiter, or they will just redirect them back to the Oort cloud. So was Jupiter necessary for life on Earth? Well, we know that impacts can extinguish you know, life, but uh, were they necessary for life as we know it on Earth? To some degree, yes, to some degree, no. I'll tell you why. So here's the thing. In order for, for us to have life on Earth, there are some criteria, right? We have to be in the right temperature. We have to have liquid water. We have to have greenhouse effects. We have to have many things that we talked about in the previous chapters, right? But it is also good that Jupiter is protecting us, okay? Because if all of these objects thousands and thousands of them are coming to the inner part of solar system and if jupiter were not there if jupiter was not protecting us then we, some of these objects could be really life-threatening could come to the earth hit the surface and you know uh, you know um, the mass extinction would happen on earth but so to some degree the answer to this question is yes and no okay Let's go over the things that we learned. The most recent major impact happened in 1994 uh, when the fragments of comet uh, Shoemaker Levi 9 hit the Jupiter. Did an impact kill the dinosaurs? We found a uh, iridium layer just above dinosaur fossils, fossils, suggesting that the impact caused mass extinction uh, 65 million years ago. And uh, the large crater that has the same age was found in Mexico. So large impacts do happen, but they do, they do happen very rarely. Uh, they can cause major extinctions about 100 million years, in every 100 million years. Juvian planets sometimes, uh, you know, deflect comets towards the Earth, but send many, many more to the back to the Oort cloud. Okay. Uh, I want to show you a, a little picture here. So I'm gonna um, go to another picture here. Okay, so this is the graphic show the orbits of all the known potentially hazard use asteroids around the Earth. So all of these blue things that you see, these blue orbits are the known asteroids. And that's where the Earth is, okay? That's the orbit of the Earth right there so do you still think the space program is needless expense uh, let's talk about this question in the uh, you know discussion page in the blackboard okay 